I'm good today. How are you doing, Ray? Great. Thank you for coming back to the show. We're going to talk about something very important to the city. Uh, most issues are. But this one has to do look at a very different kind of approach on how we look at our financial obligations and the stewardship of public funds. Something I think the public is concerned about every day. You know, how do we spend the taxpayers' dollars? Where do they go? Are we managing our resources effectively? Do we balance the budgets? So we have what has been produced as the Salinas Plan, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. give us a little history about how we got to a Salinas Plan, a 10-year financial model. So, um, you know, if you really want to go back, where this started was a couple of years ago, um, the city of Salinas was looking to partner um, with uh, workforce development um, agencies in the area and we work with a group called the National Resource Network, which is mm -hmm. was formed by the Obama administration, uh, is now a, an independent organization, and they provided um, technical assistance and funding for us to do a uh, create a partnership between Hartnell College and the five cities of the Salinas Valley, and that was a very um, successful partnership in some ways. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that when the National Resource Network decided to do a second phase looking to provide technical assistance to cities, uh, they reached out to us and they said, we're going to be looking at providing this additional funding for multi-year budgeting plans. And so we uh, and many other cities submitted um, uh, an application and they came out and they uh, looked at what we were doing, looked at our past initiatives, talked to our elected officials and senior staff, and they selected us as one of five cities to receive a 75% uh, matching grant. So the John and Laura Arnold Foundation um, has actually contributed over $300,000 towards this project, and the city of Salinas has contributed only $100,000. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, well, a four to one match, actually, uh, you know, in terms of the, the product. So when did the project start and uh, you know, who, who are the, the lead consulting firms within the National Network uh, group? Right, so the National Resource Network is actually a consortium of uh, different um, consulting groups. So with us, it was PFM Consulting Group, and as well as um, Enterprise Community Partners and Marquez Community Strategies. And so um, what was done was um, they looked at our operations and they decided that what we needed to do first of all was build a 10-year budget model. So we've been operating on a one-year budget model. We'll sometimes try to look forward a year, but we haven't actually had a, a scientific way of doing this. And mm -hmm. so what they've recommended is doing a 10-year look forward and they've constructed a 10-year model um, that allows us to do that. And so when we're evaluating the decisions we're making today. We're not just evaluating what those decisions will impact us on right now, but what those uh, decisions are going to do to us in the future as well. And that's really important because one of their findings was that um, by 2028, our annual budget deficit is supposed to exceed $10 million per year. And the cumulative budget deficit over the next 10 years is about $60 million mostly due to increases in pension costs. Um, if you look at the, uh, the mm -hmm. additional costs associated with CalPERS and um, the, their recent uh, changes to the discount rate, mm -hmm. that comes out to about $62 million over that same time frame. So if it wasn't for that, we'd actually be looking at about a $3 million cumulative deficit over the next 10 years, which would have been very manageable right. and easy to handle. But the, we're the city is subject to the California state uh, pension system requirements. We are, we are a men member. We don't actually set the investment rates. We don't uh, you know, manage the funds. We pay into uh, the fund, as I understand it, for those that are, we are responsible for uh, because they retired from the city. And then we also pay in the fund to look at, you know, potential retirement uh, to keep the fund solvent. Right, and that's one of the big challenges is that we're not just paying for the retirements of the employees that are working right now. 
We also have to pay for the fact that there was not enough money made in investment returns over the past several years, and so now CalPERS needs to make that money up. And since they are not going to take it from the employees and they're already getting as much as they can from investments, then the cities need to be the ones to pick up that slack. So, y and that is a major challenge, but like you said, we have no control over that. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to um, try to leave CalPERS, we would end up paying a bill that would be in excess of $100 million, which we don't have that. Right. Um, <laughs> and there's just really not a lot of good options here, mm -hmm. except to figure out, you know, and, and the, the core of the study is, is not about how do you make cuts to, um, to, to balance the budget. You know, uh, somebody uh, said, you know, balancing the budget is easy. Cutting the budget so it actually still works when you're done, that's the hard part. Right. So what this study looked at was how do we maintain services? How do we continue to give the public what it expects from a government organization while keeping our budget in line? And that requires us to look at, you know, how can we do things more efficiently? Are our employees being compensated in accordance with market norms? And, you know, employee compensation you always hear, you know, employees make too much. Well, if you don't pay your employees enough that you're com competitive in the market, then you're not necessarily going to get the employees that you want. Right. But at the same time, right, you can't afford, we, we don't, we're not a place that can afford to provide lavish benefits and salaries to people. We need to pay mm. people what they earn. We need to pay good wages, but not excessive wages. And also looking at other organizations that we can partner with. Okay. You know, because there's op there's opportunities for efficiencies. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have duplicative efforts of mm -hmm. people working on the same thing. Why not just have one entity work on both, work on it for both of them, and they're both contributing financially to that. Also, looking at you know what are the risks, looking at um, um, uh, you know a variety of different areas. Right. Yeah. So it, you mentioned uh, pension costs. And there are other expense uh, expenditure drivers or cost drivers on the expense side. Uh, mm -hmm. And because the city is so, uh, um, you know, direct service, uh, line services, services you, you provide, the pu we provide the public, it means that we have a lot of people to provide those services. So majority of the report, reports seem to be focused on, or a good portion, on the service end which is provided by the employees. So benefits, salary, and those type of things are uh, in the report. Is that, um, did that receive a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, feedback from the employees, from the council, as they reviewed the presentation? What sort of did you pick up when, uh, you know, you had the meetings with the employees? So I would say that, you know, you're t the first part of what you said, you know, what are the main drivers? So pensions, health care. Right. Those are by far the two main drivers. If it wasn't for pensions and health care increasing as fast as they are, we'd be in a very good place. And like you said, um, 75 to 80 percent of our budget is coming from employee costs. So you can't solve this problem without dealing with the employee cost side. And when you're dealing with employee costs, mm -hmm. you know, you can look at several options. There's layoffs. Mm -hmm. The problem with layoffs, aside from the personal costs for the employees that receive it, but if you take an officer off the street, that's one less officer providing services to the community. Right. Mm -hmm. If you cut a park maintenance worker, the parks, the grass isn't going to get mowed or the trees trimmed as often as they're supposed to be. So I think layoffs are, are really everyone's last choice. But what that means is you have to turn to, you know, well, what about employee compensation? And mm -hmm. that's where I was talking about earlier, looking at things that are related to the market. Right. So when, they, when the National Resource Network uh, folks looked at the market, they found that there were two key areas that we were over market in mm -hmm. terms of our benefits. And that was in healthcare. So right now, um, about 100% of employees' health care for them and dependents is covered, which is an exceptionally good benefit. And also on leave. So the amount of leave that is being used is about 
two-thirds the amount of the amount of leave that is being exchanged for cash. Employees have so much leave that they can't use it all, and the leave that they're not using is getting cashed out for them. Mm -hmm. So that is a $2 million per year expense just on, on that. And we can be competitive if the employees are contributing towards their leave, as well as if you know, they're uh, contributing towards their health care, as well as if they're getting the correct amount of leave. Mm -hmm. It's also a two-edged sword because what they found is that even though our compensation is good as employees, our base pay was actually low. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's a number of reasons for that relating to the amount of benefits and a number of stipends. And if you have this, you get this stipend. If you get do this, you get that stipend. Um, but their recommendation was we take that and raise base pay on a cost-neutral basis by eliminating some of these other stipends. So. To get to the final part of your question, what did employees and the council think of this? Mm -hmm. the, the bottom line is that if we don't do something, then we're looking at layoffs, service eliminations. Nobody wants that. There's a lot of things in this report that are challenging, but all of it, I believe, is infinitely preferable to the alternative. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm hearing is um, I think the employees are concerned. These represent real sacrifices on their part. But at the same time, I think they understand that in order for us to continue to provide our mission, and many of our employees are very hardworking, mm -hmm. and it, you know, they understand that you know, in order to get the job done, working, more hour, working less hours is not the solution. Right. So they understand this. I think the council understands this. But it is going to come down to a lot of um, decisions that people are going to have to make. So in the employee cost area, we're looking at perhaps uh, increased uh, health care uh, cost sharing. Contributions, right. <laughs> and then secondly, we're looking at maybe a re, uh, uh, renewal of some parts of the leave sy system so it's more effective as a leave system as opposed right. to a pay system. The third area you, you might be looking at is how the, the salary, the base salary, is computed or calculated in light of the total compensation and all the special pays and all the other benefits because the city appears to be very competitive on total compensation, you said. Correct. It's when you look at that base salary, it looks a little low. Correct. So as an example of where that would be is I receive a 2.5% stipend for having a bachelor's degree. My job requires that I have a bachelor's right. degree. Why am I getting a stipend? Right. Why not just fold that into the base pay? Mm -hmm. It should be part of my base pay if it's a requirement of the job. That just makes sense. Right. There's a lot of little stipends all over the place that have built up over the years. Mm -hmm that can be consolidated so that when you're trying to recruit people, you need to pay people fairly, partly so you can recruit the right. best people. When people are looking at the job description, they're not looking at all the little stipends, they're not looking at you know, these other little things, they're looking at base pay. We can make that higher without additional costs to the city if we just clean up the way that we pay people, make it less, make it less complicated, mm -hmm. for lack of a better way of putting it. Right. And as I recall, I think there was a fourth area that looked at uh, more efficiency and effectiveness on handling workmen's compensation, getting right. on more on perhaps the prevention side uh, in terms of training and uh, how you perform your work. Yeah, workers' compensation is challenging because uh, the way we do it, we do it on a pay-as-you-go basis. And so right. if you have a good year, then great, you save some money. If you have a bad year, then you have to find money. So there's challenges with just setting up, with completely revamping the system. But what you can do is improve uh, employee training, mm -hmm. improving safety, having someone who can do safety inspections, and essentially put these measures in place to reduce workplace accidents and reduce the incidence of employees getting hurt. Mm -hmm. So there were some other parts of the report. I mean, it's not all about employee compensation, but there were alignment issues and service alignment issues and um, <clears throat> other other things like housing 
So maybe you can go into a little bit more of what, what the service alignment might have meant in terms of partnerships or consolidation of services, whether they're agencies or rethinking some of the things the city does as its core services. Right, and that's, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah. Because there's 32 <laughs> recommendations, right. and so far we've gone through four of them in detail. And, you know, so what about the other 28? Yeah. Um, so I would say probably, so a, a good example and one that people have heard of is animal services. Mm -hmm. And there's been recommendations to consolidate the county and the city animal shelter services into one for many years. Um, because, you know, as you know, off Hitchcock Road, just south of town, yes. you've got the Salinas Animal Shelter, and then literally right across the street, you have the County Animal Shelter. And we've done some merging on a pilot program where they're sharing a manager, um, but what they're recommending is we really need to take that to the next level and just consolidate operations. And there are challenges with that mm -hmm. because the facilities are very different, um, the culture is very different, and you know there's there's interests on both sides. County employees may not want to be city employees, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things to work through. But I think one of the points is that we need to work through these because the the budget is not going to get better. Right. And solutions that we don't make are going to come up at the back end if we don't take care of them. So it's hard, but it needs to happen. Um, I think another example is, um, you know, we cr started a priority-based budgeting Correct. several years ago. Right. And so we've ranked all the different programs and, you know, tried to establish, you know, what are the programs that are really vital key core services and what are things that, you know, are good to do and what are things that, you know, given the opportunity, this is nice to have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we've never really done extensively is use that list to determine which services we're going to maintain. So another one of their recommendations was um, if you're going to provide services, you want to make sure that the services you're providing, you are providing well. And it's better to provide fewer services than to provide more services mediocre in a mediocre fashion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. You know, so that, that's another example of, you know, an operational. They also recommended moving um, some staff that work on maintenance from the public works to the library community services department mm -hmm. because that provides a more uh, direct line between those who are working and operating the facilities mm -hmm. and those who are doing the maintenance. Right. So that one department doesn't have to go to another department to ask for help right. in maintaining the facilities that it's running. And since library community services uh, runs a lot of the facilities in the city, mm -hmm. NRN felt that it made sense for them to take over that function. There was one other was interesting and it had to do with a hard asset, which is uh, our golf courses. Mm -hmm. We have two, technically speaking. So maybe you can just yeah. share with us briefly what what that recommendation would entail. So we have two golf courses. So we have the Fairways Golf Course, which is an 18-hole golf course down by the airport. Right. And it's being used for golf right now. The challenge with that one is that it um, does not cover its costs. So we do have a third-party vendor that operates it. But the general fund has to make up the difference. And so far, we've been paying about $100,000 a year uh, out of the general fund for that. But the challenge is that those are bond payments on a variable rate mm -hmm. um, bond. So if interest rates start going up, then those payments are going to start going up as well. And we've been very fortunate in the recent couple of years that interest rates have been historically low and have stayed that way. Right. Good time to be in a variable rate, but it's starting to look like that may be changing. Um, even more uh, complex is the Twin Creeks Golf Course. Mm -hmm. And right now, as you know, um, the uh, First Tee program operates out of there and the city leases the land from the county but is making bond payments on the, um, on the golf course. And originally, what was supposed to happen was that First Tee was supposed to be able to cover those bond payments and it, mm -hmm. so the city wasn't going to have to take any financial hit. But over the years, there's been you know, modifications, there's been different financial struggles. So the bottom line is that today, the city is spending over $450,000 per year on that golf course. And 
First Tee is a great program. Right. And, you know, I mean, it's certainly a great asset to the community. But, you know, every year, you know, you, you see it, we have that C those CDBG funds, and there's nonprofits that apply. And every year we're turning them away because there's not enough funding. But we're providing $450,000 to this one nonprofit. Right. Um, you know, we've got to find a better way of doing this. Mm -hmm. And some of the recommendations include the redevelopment of those sites and using the proceeds from that to pay off the bond debt. Mm -hmm. So on, um, you know, there's, you could do industrial development by the airport. Right. Twin Creeks could be a commercial development. It could be a housing, e maybe even an affordable housing project. Right. There's a lot of different potential options mm -hmm. that don't involve us spending all of this money um, to maintain the golf courses. Right. And even and if we did all that, we would still have nine holes of golf on the east side of fairways, okay. which has some development challenges because of its proximity to the runway. Okay, because of FAA requirements. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So let's get into a little bit more of the housing because that was a major section or phase of the study and the financial, 10-year financial plan. Mm -hmm. And as I recall, the housing was so acute and such a serious problem, it's impacting the rest of the city in terms of services and other uh, social economic issues. In my day job, I'm an economic development manager. Right. And when people have asked me, you know, what's your number one challenge, you know, economically, housing. Because when housing <laughs> prices go up, uh, there's an economic cost. Businesses, uh, they get upward pressure on wages. If rents are going up 15% per year, you can't expect businesses to be able to match those rates. And what that means is that it's harder for them to find employees. Mm -hmm. You know, Tanamir and Antle built those, that housing down in Spreckles because they were having trouble finding places for their employees to live. Their employees were saying, we can't come work here. Right. We can't afford to live here. There's also a human cost when you're looking at overcrowding, People are doubling or tripling up in apartments, and that just creates, you know, uh, inhumane conditions at its extreme levels. Mm -hmm. So there's the economic cost, there's the human, the human cost, and there's a financial cost. We don't collect uh, tax revenue based on pe money that people spend in rent or on house payments. Right. If we, we half of our budget comes from sales tax, so. If people have less money in their pocket to buy things because they're spending it on rent, that hits the city's bottom line. Right. Mm -hmm. So the challenge here is housing affordability and, and homelessness, of course, also uses city resources as well. Housing affordability is the challenge. The problem is we're in a situation where we're looking at major budget deficits. How do you add a whole new initiative and component mm -hmm. to what you're doing or I shouldn't say add, but radically expand an initiative component to your city services without impacting other services as well. And that was how this kind of worked its way into the report. And they came up with a number of recommendations there as well. Mm -hmm. I would say the most significant of which is the creation of a uh, rental inspection uh, program and mm -hmm. registration program, mm -hmm. where their recommendation is essentially saying, uh, rental units are essentially businesses mm -hmm. and they should be regulated as such and we should make sure that you know there there are people who rent apartments to one family the number of people who should be living that it was designed for mm -hmm. that's great you know but there are other people who will lease their garages to 40 different folks right and that's that is not great that right. is not okay right by doing regular inspections we can find out where these are. We can shut them down. We can try to provide services and assistance to those who might be getting displaced. Mm -hmm. And that should help us to deal with some of the overcrowding issues. Mm -hmm. It's also going to put the rental market back where it should be because when you're overcrowding people, bottom line is two families can afford to pay more rent than one. Right. So when, oh, when you have overcrowding, that not only allows for more rent in that one space, but it also pushes up the rents everywhere else because you're taking away the supply and just trying to cram more and more people in. Right. 
we do need to build more housing. Mm -hmm. And one of their recommendations relates to creating a housing trust fund. Mm -hmm. So the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership has already created a housing trust fund and that might be the correct vehicle. Uh, it calls for more exploration of that or perhaps the city should create its own. Mm -hmm. But what they're recommending is that this is a problem that affects everyone. And we need to bring together you know, the government, community groups, business, uh, education, workforce, everyone uh, needs to have a seat at this table, service providers, to find a solution and identify funding sources. And they're calling for about 4,000 new units over the next 10 years for very low income and below, suggesting that we should be trying to raise $6 million per year in order to accomplish that, which is a very ambitious goal. Right, right. But but that's the problem. And mm. that is one of the things I really appreciate about this report generally is that it doesn't try to say, well, what can we do? It says, here's the problem mm -hmm. and here's what you need to do to fix it. And mm. you know, some of them are real eyebrow raisers, but, right. but that's what it's going to take. We're past the point where there's an easy way to do this. We're not going to solve the housing problem by being timid or conservative. We're going to have to take bold steps. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be challenging. Some of it may be controversial, but those are the kind of initiatives that are gonna need to be taken to solve the problem. Right, and it looked like there was a target figure for the 10 year period. Yeah, just over 4,000, about right. 4,300. That's really ambitious. It, <laughs> so uh, we would hope, I guess, the city would hope, uh, that there are other resources that would come from state or federal to help, you know, get to that goal. Not to rely on them totally. Right, but and, uh, and I left that out of the list. Right. So yeah, there's government, business, you know, looking for resources as well as guidance right. from all this. But yeah, there's a number of state um, grants that are potential. Um, Proposition <laughs> one that just passed and SB one, SB two money. Um, the state has started to recognize that this is a serious issue statewide. This is not a Salinas issue, by the way. It's not just Salinas yeah. has expensive housing and every place else is fine. It's not. Mm -hmm. This is a, a statewide issue, much like health care and pensions. Right. You know, a lot of the issues that we are dealing with here are things that are coming from outside. So uh, they are looking at using that as a financial resource as well. But they are uh, suggesting that if we're contributing local money, Mm -hmm. then that will help us justify getting that state and federal money that could be available. Mm -hmm. So that's a key component is that it's not just, like you said, it's not just that, right. but that is part of it. But we need to show that we're going to ante up first. Right. So it calls for, uh, it's a call to action for the city to really take a, a really strong leadership role. And that role may be more than just being you know, housing inside the city, it may be housing. Could be regional. Yeah. Yeah, uh, housing to help is with not the a city whole problem. issue. Right. Absolutely. Well, great, Andy. It's great to have you back on the show. A very, very tough and challenging uh, topic financial stability and sustainability for the city of Salinas. But it looks like we have a plan called the Salinas Plan. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for having me. We look forward to seeing you again and some additional uh, progress on the Salinas plan. Mm -hmm.